Hello, this is Jerry Morton. You are about to listen to true stories I have written relating to events from my early childhood, my adolescence, and through my adulthood into my senior years. I think you will find them interesting as they reflect many of the diverse subcultures within the United States I have experienced under the microscope of time. What I think you'll find in these stories is a reaffirmation of the sense of fairness that exists within all of us, regardless of our backgrounds or current life situations. As I reflect on my life, I realize how fortunate I have been to experience so many different belief systems throughout my childhood and into my adult years. In 1942, I was born into a career U.S. Coast Guard family that moved rather frequently. Through my childhood and into my teenage years, I had the opportunity to live in six different states while attending at least eight different public schools. During my junior and senior high school years, I worked a variety of part-time jobs, like picking up towels in a YMCA weight room, counseling at a summer Boy Scout camp, and cutting up whole chickens and clerking for a retail poultry store. My college years found me living in a new state, Kentucky. While completing my four years of undergraduate studies in psychology and English, I was employed as the director of student employment in the Center College Dining Hall. The summer before the freshman year of college and the following summer, I worked as a lifeguard in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My family had moved there in the middle of my 10th grade and remained there for a year after I graduated from high school. The next two summers, I worked as a deckhand on an ocean-going dredge boat out of Port Lavaca, Texas. Most of my fellow deckhands were Hispanic or from the Louisiana Bayou country. After graduating from college in 1964, I went to Miami University of Ohio for two years to earn a master's degree in school psychology. Immediately upon graduating from the university in August 1966, I was forced by circumstances to enter the U.S. Army. A book I wrote in 2004, Reluctant Lieutenant, from Basic to OCS in the 60s, describes my year of Army training. Texas A&M University Press published it as a military history book. Those stories are part of this series of podcasts. After completing the year of training, I was unexpectedly assigned to the Psychological Warfare School at the Special Warfare Center, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. I spent two years there as a psychology instructor, assisting those assigned to my classes in understanding and relating to a variety of cultures in other countries. This experience prepared me extremely well for my first job upon leaving the Army in 1969. I was a master's level school psychologist serving seven inner city schools in St. Petersburg, Florida, as those schools were being integrated for the first time. After two years in St. Petersburg, I entered the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, Tennessee, as a doctoral student in psychology. I specialized in school psychology. Two years later, I had obtained my Ph.D. and was employed as a director of psychological and special education services for the Little Tennessee Valley Educational Cooperative. The year I began working, 1973, was the first year Tennessee began implementing its new special education laws, which were followed in 1975 by the first comprehensive federal special education laws. Due to the tragic death of the Educational Cooperative's director in December of 1975, I became the director of the cooperative and remained in that role until 2014. During my off-duty time in Tennessee, I began exploring claims of psychic experiences. 
This exploration has taken me to belief systems I would never have considered before and caused me to alter many heretofore unrecognized belief systems within myself. While all of this was taking place, I have continued to live the life of a person who works to value all, all of the remarkable people with whom I have had the privilege of interacting. The following story, Bully, is one from my adolescent years. The plan for these weekly podcasts is to read one story a week. I will start today with a series of stories from my teenage years, to be followed by ones from my early childhood. Then I will begin the stories from my college years and continue those adult stories to the present. Once I finish with these stories, I will read the stories written about my year of Army training. After that, well, that's a long time from now. Let's just see how things develop. All of the stories are copyrighted. You can blog me at authorsguildoftn.org on my author's page. Now for podcast one, titled Bully. It happened in first period English. He hadn't bothered me all that much this year. September was almost over without his trying to touch me, mess up my hair, or attempt to push my books off of my desk as he'd done on and off in homeroom most of last year. I sat in the middle of the row of seats beside the windows. He sat three rows over and about four desks back from the front. I was talking to this nice classmate in the seat in front of me. We were excited about the first graded paper that would be returned as soon as the bell rang for the class to begin. I didn't see him coming. In the middle of my saying something to my new friend, a wet finger rammed into my ear. As I instinctively swatted my hand at the withdrawing finger and turned my head to see what was going on, the guy rushed on down the row, going to his seat with a big grin that stayed directed my way until he sat on his desk chair. This had to stop now. I had learned a lot since last year. No longer was I naive about bullying or about whom the bullies were or what the victims had to do to prevent their lives from being a living hell. Goodview Subdivision was located on Root River in the northwest corner of Racine County, Wisconsin. It was about a 45-minute ride by school bus to get to Washington Junior High School in Racine. That's where I began ninth grade after finishing eighth grade in Kenosha, Wisconsin. I had just completed seventh and eighth grade at Kenosha's Washington Junior High School. As soon as the eighth grade school was over, we moved to Goodview. I was a little sad to be moving from Kenosha. The people there were very nice to me and my family. At the end of 8th grade, I had been awarded the Good Citizenship Award from a community organization that presented it each year to the student selected for it by the teachers and students from the 8th grade. I was pleased to have been so honored. In addition, I was going to attend Kenosha's Camp Odakota Boy Scout Summer Camp for a month. Yes, it was a little sad to leave Kenosha, but I had summer camp coming up. I see a lot of old friends there. Besides, my family was always moving to a new location. The adventure of meeting new kids and doing new things was by now an eagerly anticipated event. The actual move to Goodview didn't seem like much. We had spent many weekends prior to the move, in the little one-level slab house throughout the spring. The houses were being sold at bargain prices because they were in different levels of completion. My dad spent several weekends laying down the terrazzo tiles on the cement floor of the house, completing the attic installation and installing some of the missing doors. 
He worked hard and long into the night to get the house ready to live in. I helped where I could. My primary task was helping my mother care for my two brothers. The youngest was just a baby, and the other was nine. When we moved into the house, it finally dawned on me just how isolated the subdivision really was. In Kenosha, we live within walking distance of the movie theater, the stores, and the schools. In Goodview, there was nothing. There were no stores, no movies, no parks, no playgrounds, and not much of anything else. Well, the exception was a lot of little houses on brown dirt lots. I take that back. There was Root River. It ran behind our house and was bordered by the woods that varied in thickness. I loved the water, and I loved being in the woods. The river was more like a big creek. The other side of the river was Milwaukee County. The city of Milwaukee was further from the subdivision than Racine was. That wasn't much help as it took a long time to get to Racine. The only way to get there was by car. Being a one-car family put a real damper on going anywhere besides the subdivision and school. The first two weeks of living in the new house was filled with unpacking boxes, putting things away, and settling in. There wasn't much time to get to know any of the kids living in the subdivision before I took off for Boy Scout camp. When I returned from that month-long adventure, there wasn't much time to get to know anyone to hang out with. I did learn a few things about the students I'd be going to school with. The subdivision had about 50 boys in it who were attending the junior high school or the high school. I was soon to learn that I was one of approximately five guys who had not served a significant period of time in prison. Amazingly, none of the guys from the subdivision were ever in any of my classes. Part of that was that I had always done fairly well in school. That was not the case for most of the neighborhood kids. The mornings provided me with the bulk of my learning experiences concerning how things worked in the subdivision among us kids. It was while we waited for the school bus that my social education took place. The two dominant games played were hawkers and herdem. Sometimes widgies was played, but not that often. Widgies was used by someone who considered himself to be physically overpowering when compared to the victim. He would quietly come up behind the victim and violently grab the back of his pants yank up on them, and pull the pants, almost completely lifting the target off the ground and driving the crotch of his pants into his groin. Another game was grabbing the front of a guy's shirt in the hopes of getting a grip on a nipple and twisting. That really hurt. You needed to be constantly on guard for that one. Naturally, those initiating those games indicated that it was done all in fun to amuse and impress the other bystanders. Hawker's goal was to snuff up big gobs of snot and spit it as close as you dared at the back of someone's coat. If the person spit at didn't retaliate or become aggressive in some effective way, the spitter, the hawker, would spit closer and closer to the person's coat. Without an aggressive response or a particular weak response from the victim, the spitter felt free to actually hit the coat. Sometimes as many as six or ten gobs of slime would cling to the back of a guy's coat as he finally boarded the morning bus. Hurt him was a pretty straightforward attempt to hurt another guy. It began by someone walking up to you and punching you firmly in the shoulder. The punch had to be hard enough to hurt, but not your hardest punch by a long shot. The receiver of the punch was not to display any sign that he was in pain. He also had a free punch. He was expected to turn around and punch his assailant in the shoulder with a little bit harder punch than he had received. 
this series of ever-increasing power punches continued until one guy stopped. Now, the way that that person chose to stop was important. It had to be done with style. If you didn't do it right, it would be a signal to all the other guys to start using your arm as a punching bag. A week or two into the school year, I was still trying to master the best way of ending the Hurdum game. It was a favorite of John's. John was really big for his age, although I was never sure of his actual age. He was in the same grade as I was, but was bigger than anyone else. He was at least six feet three inches tall and weighed around 220 pounds or more. He was full of muscle. For comparison purposes, back then I was about five feet ten inches tall and weighed around 130 pounds. Some of the things I had going for me were that I had a good sense of humor with a touch of a sarcastic bite. I knew that I knew how to fight, and I was far stronger than I looked. Anyway, on this one fall day, there had been an early snow. There was an inch or two of it on the ground. It was nothing to slow traffic down, but just enough to make the cold a little colder. As we were getting off of the school bus, John decided to punch me in the shoulder. It hurt. I instinctively punched his arm hard, really hard. I didn't need the stuff at that point. He took offense and started at me with his fist up just as the bus was pulling away. Hold off, I screamed in his face. Let me drop these books off at the house. I can't pay for damages. Then I'll clean your clock. Okay, you shit, I'll take mine home and come back and kick your ass. That's just fine. See you in half an hour behind my house. Damn. I had a way of getting myself into fixes. Fighting was all right in the heat of the moment, but given time to think before the fight, I always found myself reflecting on the mess I had gotten myself into. John was going to really hurt me. There was no way around it. He was so much bigger and stronger than I was. This was bad. He knocked on the back door. I opened it and stepped outside without putting my coat on. I needed as much freedom of movement as I could get. You little turd, I've come to smash your face in, he said as he slapped me on the side of my head. That was it. Nobody slaps me. Just as he was pulling back his fist to land a solid blow to my head, I let go with a right hook that was as fast and as strong as I could make it in my rage. It landed solidly on the side of his nose. He fell to his knees, holding his damaged appendage as the blood gushed through the cupped fingers of his hands. I can't breathe! I can't breathe! He shouted, spitting blood on the front of my shirt. Without thinking, I scooped up a double handful of snow and pressed it to the back of his neck. Hold the snow on your neck. I'll get some more for you to hold on your nose. Tip your head back. He obeyed. The second helping of snow went into his outstretched free hand and then to the base of his nose while I grabbed another handful of snow and placed it with the melting snow he was still holding on the back of his neck. We stood together in this strange embrace for a minute or two. It worked. His nose stopped bleeding. He thanked me as he wiped his hands in the snow and brought more snow to his upper lip to wipe smeared blood off. He didn't do a particularly good job. His face and shirt were a mess. How, how'd you know what to do? I learned it in Boy Scouts. Hey, hey, lucky me, eh? Actually, I learned it from my mother. She had used that technique on me more than once to stop the various bloody noses I would acquire from being naturally adventuresome. It just didn't seem to be the right moment to tell your newly vanquished foe that your mother taught you how to stop his nose from bleeding as a result of a punch you had thrown just seconds before. After he had assured me that he was okay, we shook hands and parted as friends. 
Now, this didn't mean that he never started the Hawkers game or the Herdham game with me again. Far from it. However, when I returned a Hawker near his coat or gave him a harder punch in the shoulder than I had received, he would just laugh and turn to someone else to begin the games again. There were some really strange and often violent things that took place during the year and a half I lived there. For example, in the late spring, the county sent some social workers to Goodview. I guess the county felt that we needed some professional guidance with so many guys going in and out of jail. Our little subdivision had acquired a reputation in the relatively short time of its existence. One encounter that made this point occurred in the suburb of, of Milwaukee. I was waiting one night for my mother to pick me up from a meeting I attended at this missionary church in South Milwaukee. It was dark out. Everyone else had left. My mother was late. It was understandable as the church was at least an hour away from our house. While waiting on the steps, some guys on motorcycles drove slowly by. They gave me a good look over as they passed. Towards the end of the street, they turned and came back. They stopped in front of the steps I was sitting on. These guys were men. They looked mean. They quizzed me aggressively and asked if I had any money on me. I was scared. The whole thing was looking to end badly. Where are you from, kid? Good view, off of Root River. No, you're not. I am. Who do you know there that we might know? Well, uh, there's Frog and Sims. You know them? Okay, kid. You're all right. Tell them, fill in the guys, said, hey. With that, they all started their motorcycles and drove off in a lot of smoke and the fading roar of their cycles. The county social workers were clearly do-gooders sent to save us kids, was the word going around. That produced laughter and curiosity. From our collective perspective, we didn't need saving. These people didn't have a clue about what was really going on here. Even if they did, there was nothing they could do about it. This one social worker had to have been a weightlifter. He was all sculpted muscle. I mean, he had developed an awful lot of muscle just about everywhere. If you had told me that his ears had big muscles, I might have believed you. Clearly, you just did not want this guy mad at you. He could dominate any fighter we of the good view could produce, with the exception maybe of one guy who is not here at the time. The social worker knew that he physically dominated us guys, his swagger, his muscled arms held slightly away from his torso as if about to repel an assault, and his haughty stare told anyone thinking of starting trouble that this guy just knew he could pound you into the dirt without breaking into a sweat. This, this strong man social worker calls all of us guys fooling around the teen center to gather around him. The teen center was one of the unfinished houses near the center of the subdivision that had been donated somehow for the use of the community. Anyway, this guy calls all of us around him and says he wants to play a game with anyone willing to play it with him. Taking a large bandana from his back pocket and tying a huge knot in the end of it as he spoke, making sure that the knot was rock solid, he says that he will lean against the house wall and wait for someone to pick up the bandana from the ground behind him and swat him on the butt as hard as they can. Then the hitter is to throw the bandana back on the ground. As soon as the man is hit, he will turn around to see if he can catch the person who has hit him. If 
he can correctly identify that person, then that person has to stand with his back to the crowd and be hit. He will have to stand there and be hit until he can be quick enough to turn around and correctly identify his hitter. Thus the game would continue for a while. We all looked at each other. This guy looked fast enough to catch the hitter after the first time to me. I sure would not want to be hit by a swing of the knotted end of the bandana from this guy. Why was he doing this? We all were amused that this adult would want to engage us guys in this way. The girls seemed to think it was pretty funny. What was he trying to prove? He didn't need to prove anything to me. There had to be 30 or 40 of us standing behind the fellow as he stood with his back to us, resting his eyes on his forearm pressed against the wall. The crowd murmured as I swung around to see if anyone would rise to the challenge. Quick as a mountain lion springs on its prey, frog bit down, grabbed the long end of the bandana and swung it. Its contact on the man's butt sounded like a rifle shot. Before you could blink an eye, Frog had thrown the bandana on the ground to assume a relaxed stance in the first row of kids. Instantaneously, the guy shot around. He pointed to Sims. You did it. You did it, didn't you? The crowd hooted and hollered. He knew he was wrong. Smiling, he turned to assume the position for punishment again. Again, Frog picked the bandana up and administered an astonishingly punishing blow. As he threw the bandana down, he switched places with Sims. Even faster than the first time the social worker twisted around to face the crowd, he pointed at the guy had, that I had seen Frog knock unconscious with one blow last summer. The crowd booed the supposed savior of us wayward youth. The poor social worker allowed his butt to be hit by Frog three or four more times before he called an end to the game. I think he was a little wiser than when he had started. In any event, we were proud to have seen a cocky adult muscle man meet his match. We were proud of us as a group. You had just better watch out if you messed with the guys from Goodview. When I returned from being away for the entire summer season as a camp counselor at Camp O Dakota, the summer between my ninth and tenth grade, all of the kids were busting to tell me the story of Frog and Sims. The story was told with great humor and pride. We all knew that Frog and Sims hung out together most of the time. They had spent some hard time in prison together in the past, I'd been told. They were pretty much inseparable, it seemed. All I knew was that it was good to stay away from them, although both of them seemed to respect me. They never tried to hassle me or engage in the teasing games with me. I was a rarity in that respect. As the story went, a few weeks before I had returned to Goodview, Frog and Sims stole a car from someone's driveway in the subdivision. Apparently, they didn't want to sell it or anything like that. It was just a fast car. They wanted to drive it as fast as they could up and down the highway at the far end of the subdivision, the highway that went to Milwaukee. They just tore up the highway, driving the car back and forth with the wheels screaming on the curves, the motor roaring on the straightaways, and the wind whipping in their faces. They did this many times, until the engine blew. They ditched the car off the side of the road, right where it had died. Well, it didn't take the highway patrol long to come pounding on Frog's and Sim's front doors. There were a lot of highway patrol cars that showed up for the arrest. They surrounded the two nearby houses Frog and Sims lived in as if a major shootout was going to take place. Well, of course, everyone turned out to watch the show. 
The street in front of the two wild riders' houses was full of onlookers. Frog and Sims opened their doors, raised their hands, and calmly walked up to the state cops amidst the cheers of the crowd. The state troopers had them put their hands behind their backs and cuffed them. They were escorted to a highway patrol car and put in the back seat. The back doors of the police car remained open as the officers talked among themselves and the onlookers shouted words of encouragement to their beloved criminals. Frog and Sim shouted out humorous comments to the crowd, which pleased everyone. Even the police officers laughed. They weren't particularly concerned about their two prisoners, it seemed. Suddenly, Frog and Sims exited the p police cruiser and took off running into the nearby woods. They didn't run particularly fast, as running was hampered by the cuffed hands behind their backs. The crowd roared with laughter. The two of them couldn't get far. Reportedly, the police didn't fully understand what was happening until the two of them had just about reached the tree line. The officers formed a firing line and began walking into the woods after them as they shouted for the two fugitives to surrender. Once in the woods, the officers held up their pistols and shot into the air, trying to flush the guys out. It was understood that they were shooting straight up into the air so as not to accidentally shoot either Frog or Sims. All of a sudden, Frogs and Sims started walking from the tree line. They got to the police car they were originally in and calmly sat down in it. What a cool move it was! and the crowd roared its approval of this gutsy finesse. It took the troopers a while to realize that the two of them had returned to the car. Everyone admired the audacity of the two guys. They were definitely stupid, but they had somehow demonstrated that they were smarter than the state troopers. The consensus of those telling me the story was that once again, Frog and Sims showed everyone that they were good guys. They had approached folk hero status. So, this bully had given me a wet willy. I could not let this stand. If I did not do something, make some kind of a statement, my life in this school would be hell. The bell rang. The English class had been gunned. Everyone was seated as the teacher told the class that she would hand back the graded essay papers and proceeded to discuss some of the good points she had observed in them and some of the issues we could approve upon for the next paper we would write. She went to the head of the first row of chairs by the hallway door, picked out the right number of papers to be passed back down the row, and then started to repeat the process on the second row with clear determination. I quietly maneuvered myself out of the desk chair without scooting it as I maneuvered past the armrest writing table part of it. I determinedly walked to the back of my row, over to his row, up to his chair, he never saw me coming. He sat in his chair, looking at the teacher, preparing to give the first person in his row the papers to hand back. Pulling back my fist, I let fly a downward punch into his jaw. It was a solid, hard punch. Not as hard as I could have thrown, but definitely one that would really hurt. He was stunned. He tried to get out of his chair, but was held back by the armrest, riding station part of it, and his inability to untangle his feet from under it. I pulled back to lay another one on him if it looked as if he was actually going to get out of the chair. When the teacher began pushing me back, she had both her arms spread out, holding us apart. He stopped struggling to get out of the chair. Boys, boys, you stop this right now, she stated in alarm. Jerry, you get back to your seat. I did. Periodically, the guy shot mean glances at me. That was okay. I hadn't finished with him. It was okay if he wanted to continue this. Oh, I had gotten an A on my paper. 
The bell rang. The class was over. He waited for me at the door. When we were face to face, he spat out, This isn't over. I'm going to get you. That's f just fine. I'll meet you in front of the football stadium right after school. We'll fight all right. I'll be there, and I'll smash you to pieces. With that, we parted. By the end of second period, all of the guys from Goodview seemed to have heard of the confrontation. They wanted to know what was going to happen. I told them. John was particularly excited about it all as he asked, Do you want a couple of us to just knock the shit out of him as he's leaving the class, the last class? He's a hell of a lot bigger than you are. We can take care of him for you. No, no, I can fight my own fights. It would, it would be good if some of the guys could show up with me just in case some of his guys decide to jump into the fight. I just need to, for his people to keep, be kept off of me. It, it, it would mean you'd miss the bus. It's done. We'll be there. We got your back. By the end of the third period, it seemed that the whole school knew that there was going to be a rumble between the Goodview guys and the Bullies guys. The more I thought about it, the more I thought that having the guys there was a bad idea. Why, half the school might turn out to watch the fight. The whole thing was a bad idea. First of all, this guy was so much bigger than I was, and he had a hell of a lot more muscle. I was probably going to get the shit kicked out of me. Then there was the issue of our guys. Some of them were not going to stand by while I got the shit knocked out of me. This could have end up being a large-scale free-for-all. Some of the good view guys just might pick up tree branches, boards, or rocks to use if it got really bad. The whole thing could get extremely violent. People would be seriously injured. There would be blood. The police would show up. People would be arrested. I could be arrested. I would be the one who assaulted the guy in the first place. No, this was bad. This was very bad. At lunch, I put out the word that the fight had been called off. I was not going to fight the guy. No one needed to miss the bus. For the rest of that day and through the night, I dreaded the thought of showing up at school the next morning. The bully was going to make my life hell. No one had much to say to me during the bus ride home, nor in the morning going back to school. I walked into English class, ready to receive my medicine. Fortunately, the bully hadn't arrived yet. I sat in my usual seat by the window, waiting for my nemesis. I saw him in the hallway as he approached the door. He entered without a glance my way. Quickly, he went straight to his seat. He never looked towards the window. That was the way it was. He would never look in my direction. The classroom hour passed without a glance my way. When the bell to change classes rang, he was just one of the very first, if not the first, to leave the room. That was the way that first semester of school at Horlick High School passed. The bully never looked at me directly. He never approached me and appeared to go to great lengths to stay as far away from me as possible. His behavior was a puzzlement to me. I did not understand why he didn't confront me as a coward, why he didn't take my failure to show up for the fight as an incentive to bully me even more. Years had to pass before I finally felt that I had figured it out.